Johns. Focused on quality and convenience, there isn't much you won't find at Marie's Mini Mart. Homestyle breads, sandwiches, plus a variety of artisan breads and delicious single-serve desserts available exclusively at our Frecker Drive location. Marie's Mini Mart, with 25 locations wherever you go, there we are. Hi, I'm Carl Wells. Well, my guest today has had one foot firmly planted in the corporate business world and another foot planted in the world of musical theater for much of her life. For over 30 years, she's been the president of Quality Plus Inc., which is a management company uh, consulting in health, safety, environmental and quality systems. Uh, she's also the executive producer and artistic director of TADA Events. It's my pleasure to welcome <laughs> <laughs> this very busy lady, <laughs> Terry Andrews, to the program. Thank welcome, you very Terry. much. It's nice to be here. Yeah. Um, so I'm assuming that uh, much of your artistic qualities you you probably inherited from your dad or yeah yeah uh, I guess the love of a good story came from my mother mm -hmm. um, you know she did recitations and all that sort of stuff but she couldn't sing a note and dad of course was a, a working musician so our house was Chrissy always Andrews. Chrissy Andrews mm -hmm. yeah and house was always filled with musicians and and music and uh, you know, I, I remember as a little as a little girl, Dad worked at Sears in the daytime. So you know, you, you had to have a side gig. Yeah, that's um, right. Everybody. Maybe that's why I do is because I saw yeah. Dad do it. Yeah. Uh, so he was working all day and then playing all night, and you know, I'd be in the car with Mom or in the station wagon because there were so many of us going to pick up his drums to take them from one place to the next so that they'd be there for the night before. But uh, yeah. It, uh, that's where it comes from. It comes from Dad. Where would he be playing? I guess places like uh, Fort Pepperell, uh, oh, a lot, the old yeah. colony. Yeah, yeah, you you got that. Yeah. Uh, during the war, and you know the time thereafter, he, a lot of what he was doing was down on the base. But mm -hmm. I remember him going back and forth on the weekends to Argentia. Now that was after the time, mm -hmm. but there was still a presence out there. And, uh, you know, they'd go as far, him and his band would go as far as Gander uh, on a Friday night to do a gig. But in town, they were doing a lot of the old colony and uh, the Commodore and, you know, stuff down at the Star of the Sea or, you know, wherever, wherever it had to be with the colony and the Commodore, I remember a lot. Mm. Yeah. Now, you went to Holy Heart of Mary when it was Roman Catholic, all girls, uniforms, the sisters. Uh, what were those okay. years like? You know, it was interesting because um, at least one, maybe two of the years that I was there, there were a lot a lot of girls in that school. There were 1,644 of us at one point, and we were actually that year on shifts because... This was like the baby boom, I guess. I guess that's yeah. what it was, yeah. yeah. Well, when I think about it, yeah, that's probably what it was. Yeah. Um, and some people have good memories, some people have bad memories. Mine are pretty well good memories, and I guess maybe this whole producing thing showed up then because I was on the student council and the social committee, and and you know, um, pretty involved in arranging concerts and mm -hmm. so on. And uh, the student council had a pretty good relationship with the, with the administration and the nuns at that point, and we would work out some deals mm -hmm. that if we can have these bands that normally wouldn't be at Holy Heart in an all-girls school, mm -hmm. then we can make this kind of a revenue and then we, we can split it. And there were little, <laughs> you know, that kind of stuff uh, was open to me and I we still had to do I still had to kneel on the floor and if the uniform didn't touch the floor then you had to let your uniform down but we had a lot going on and a lot of uh, camaraderie and and as I said my uh, my experiences with the staff there were always really good so yeah. it, it was and the, great. And the theater in that school 
state of the art. At the time. That was really the arts yeah. and culture center of its day. It was, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah, it was. And the sound. What was it, 1,100 seats or something? It, or at then it was around 1,100 yeah. seats. Yeah, they've changed the configuration a little bit. But when we had assemblies, when you think about 1,644 people mm -hmm. going to school there, we couldn't accommodate them all in that theater. So when we had um, assemblies, but when we had concerts, we had a lot of stuff that we would do there. And they still have it available to them, which is great, but the community now does as well. Um, we were working in a space that is still enviable to be able to do it. So, and there were AV rooms, and there were choral rooms, and there were band rooms. And um, from an arts perspective, and sports as well, but uh, you know, I'm not that sporty. Mm -hmm. um, from an arts perspective, it was the place to be, and it was utilized quite a lot. And um, what about what about you now? Your your uh, talent did it first manifest itself in in acting, singing, producing what? Singing, mm -hmm. singing. I took uh, voice lessons and piano lessons, and then continued with voice lessons right up into my twenties. Um, I actually didn't get involved in theater until I did a musical with you know. A, I think it was uh, Oklahoma. And, Oklahoma. And it was because of the music that I auditioned for it, and I, and I really liked acting. And then, then after that, I studied acting, which has become sort of my heart. But I'm very firmly rooted in the musical side of everything. And w w where was Oklahoma produced? At the Arts and Culture Center. You know, I think I saw that. Yeah, yeah. There's I a lot of us who were out there. I probably saw you in Oklahoma. <laughs> I was. I was, strangely enough because I'm not a dancer, but I was cast as one of two dance hall girls. And yeah. um, it was so much fun. It was uh, so yeah, much fun. Bet, yeah. yeah, and uh, there's a couple of times when I got cast in roles where they were dancing and you know, I'd be behind the scene going, what are they thinking to put me in that role? But, because yeah. I was a singer. Now, that probably wasn't the first time you appeared on stage. When no. You, what was your first stage? appearance I got I got a very vivid vivid memory because it was so horrible of being four years old I was at a school called Winterton so where the CNIB is down on uh, down by the lake now that the was a, yeah. that was a school and mm -hmm. that's where I started school was at Winterton and we did I think it was at the little theater in Mun mm -hmm. we did a play there I was four uh, honest to God four years old and I was one of the elves in The Shoemaker and the Elves. And all of our costumes were paper mache or, or crepe paper. Mm -hmm. So we had to run out and we jumped up and sat on this little table, with the elves in the nighttime working on the shoes. And my little crepe paper outfit caught on a nail on the set. Tore. And when I, no, when I got to go, when I stood up, I fell over. <laughs> and I remember <laughs> running off the stage crying and, and stage manager, I guess, on the side saying, go back out. But anyway, I went back out, and I think that set me up. <laughs> That's probably why I didn't do theater for a lot of years. You know, it's funny. I have I have a horrible me memory about those crepe paper. Oh my God! <laughs> costumes too, because when I was in kindergarten, uh, I had I had one for the Hall school Halloween party, <clears throat> and I was dressed as a clown, and it and it got torn, and I felt so miserable. Yeah, <laughs> having exactly. Having to walk around with this torn costume. Is it, it, see, it's still with you. How it's many years later? That's right. That's that's why I place an awful lot. And no, I, I, was not I can show you a picture of me in that costume, <laughs> taken at Harrington School. Go away. And uh, I have the saddest face <laughs> you have ever seen on a child. I mean, it's it's <laughs> it's incredible. I'm telling uh, you know what? Of our age group, mm -hmm. there's probably not too many people who don't have it. Um, mm. Or the, or the crepe paper streamers yeah, in the gym, or that's right. and then the water hits them and the dye goes there. Uh, yeah, you know, that's right. <laughs> uh, now, so uh, you you have these two two talents. You've you've got this talent for business and this talent for the arts. They're not mutually exclusive, but it's unusual to see somebody you know who kind of can nurture both of these. And, and, and develop them into, well, 
you know, kind of competing careers. How, mm -hmm. how, did, how did you manage to do that? Um, well, I guess I went out to BC and I was doing, I was working in a law firm in the day, you know, part time mm -hmm. and I was going to school and I was doing theater and I was doing, you know, music and so on. And I got involved in theater pretty heavily in Victoria primarily and then uh, Vancouver afterwards. Got an agent, got to the point where they said I became castable, we'll see. Um, but I came home and because my dad was dying and I came home for a little while and I figured out that living hand to mouth was not really what I liked to do. Um, you know, if I had a show or something, then that was great and everything was done, paid the rent and so on. And if I didn't, then I lived like an artist. And, you know, I was going, now, hmm, this can't be the best way to do it. Mm -hmm. So uh, I started taking business courses as well. So I'd done theater and I'd done English and then I went into business school. And I like that. And th I think that probably goes back to Holy Heart and, and being the one who was producing or, or you know, on the social committees or on the student councils or so on. So that side of things always intrigued me. Um, maybe it's just that I'm not capable of having a boss. I don't know, you know. Uh, but so, so I started doing that and project management became my thing and, uh, and marketing. That led into some companies that I was involved with because I could write I would be writing technical papers and so on. And, and it's just a convoluted way that finally what, what ended up happening was, well, I love theater, I miss it. I love music, I miss it. I love doing this management stuff that I do. And now I'm trained as a quality auditor at this mm -hmm. point and a quality technician. Mm -hmm. So why don't I open this company? Mm -hmm. And that led on to, I just kept going to school, you know? Mm -hmm and taking things, and, and it's project management. So for me, these big musicals and these big events that I do, mm. um, they are projects. So you conceptualize the project, you fund them, you build them, you br put your team together, you execute them, and then you demobilize. And to me, that's what we do in the quality environmental health and safety mm. world is mm. big projects and pr manage the projects. So yeah, let's let's talk about that. So quality plus ink. If if I came from another country or whatever, and I knew nothing about your business, um, what say would you, if I owned a, a, a furniture company? I uh, my company made furniture and sold furniture. What what could you do for for me and my company? Uh, well, the, um, you don't have to come from another country not to know. I mean, if, I, if people ask me what I do and I tell them, they'll go blank. Mm. A lot, you know, unless you're in an industry that has dictated you need it. Mm. But when you find out, it's what people do anyway, I inherently, if they're good business people. But essentially, if they're international standards, that if you want to sell your product or your service uh, to a certain industry or to other areas in the world, you, you need to be recognized or have some accreditation or have something similar. So when the, when the global marketplace opened up um, and we were all of a sudden uh, selling products or services to Brazil or Japan or the United States or so on, they all had their own quality standards that you had to adhere to and meet. So companies that wanted to do that had to find out what all these quality standards were and if they needed policies or procedures or processes or uh, link their strategic objectives with quality objectives and all of that good stuff, QA, QC, inspections. They had to do that to Canadian standards, to American standards, to Japanese standards, whatever it was. And uh, a couple of decades ago, there was an international standard uh, ISO 9001, which is a quality standard that is international it's across the world. So now what that means is that if you build a system, which is your policies, your procedures, your way to do things, if you do that and you are compliant with this standard in Canada, then you are compliant anywhere in the world. So now companies anywhere in the world can say that company in Newfoundland has a quality system and it meets this standard and that is equivalent to what we require so they don't have to send anyone that you know they can buy from you so 
that changed the landscape and that is the basis of what I do. But then there would be a, a laboratory quality system, a quality standard, and there's a quali there's quality standard for everything, software development. So what my company does will be, here's the standard, we don't know your business, but we can't learn it, but we know the standard. So we know what you need to do, you tell us how you do it, and then we'll help you put this together, and so on. And likewise, over the years, you know, be, between myself and the people who work with me, we got the qualifications for health and safety and also for environmental management. So these are all uh, systems that help you meet either quality requirements, business mm. requirements, environmental And I'm guessing, Terry, that because of the pandemic, you've been able to adapt and do more and more of your work mm. online and yeah. remotely, right? Yeah. Uh, an awful lot. It's changed a lot. The, as you know, the whole theater and production side of things crashed. We were mm. the only big show in Newfoundland that was on the stage. Mm. And they walked in and said, you got, you know, three hours. Get out. Mm. On opening night of Lacage, that was devastating. And that's for mm. all of us in that industry. It's been a really rough ride. Mm. On the other side of things, um, because we could pivot and we were already working in systems where, you know, uh, I was do, uh, do a lot of work offshore and on big construction sites, or I'm a, I'm a quality auditor and I would be doing audits flying to the States or somewhere to do an audit. We could go into the system that they already had and say, listen, we can do a lot of this stuff online. We can, people were getting laid off, but they still had to have, they still had to have their quality audits or their quality people or their health and safety. They still had to do that. There's still incident investigations. So we could do that, a lot of it online. And I think it's changed the way that a lot of people are doing business. And it's going to continue to a certain extent that way. Mm -hmm. So we continue to be busy out of the office and never did stop. Mm -hmm. And your husband, Wayne Party, he, he works in this field as well, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's what, what, so what role does he play? Uh, he's the guru on occupational health and safety mm -hmm. in, with our company. He's you know, been on the committees that have written the standards, and he was uh, advisor to the, um, to the minister and changed mm -hmm. the occupational health and safety regulations here and so on. We've written a couple of books together. He's written some himself, and uh, that's what he does. So he's, and it's funny because he did that, and I was doing this when we met. There's not many people do what we do here, so it was kind of strange that we would, mm -hmm. you know, oh, you do that, you understand what I do, and and you know, he works with my company as well now, mm -hmm. and. Um, but also we both do the shows together because he's also a really good singer. <laughs> and so, you know, it's, it's a good life. Marriage made in heaven, sounds like. Well, you know, depending. If you don't get along, it would be a marriage made in hell. But yeah. No, yeah, we, yeah we, we work together really well. Terry, just uh, talk for a second about uh, leadership. Um, do you think uh, great leaders are, are born or... <sighs> I, uh, I think people are born with the, the ability to be great leaders. So like some are more inclined that way. If you're a total introvert, then you probably don't want to be. But um, it's a skill, and it's a skill that needs to be developed, and it's one that I'm still developing. I, I'm a Leo, so I think I'm a leader. Other people think I'm bossy. Uh, you know, <laughs> it's just the way it is. But um, I, it's evolving for me. And I'm learning that to be a leader, a lot of the times is not that you have to do it, which I think is a mistake that some people uh, will make early on. I certainly did. Um, it's surrounding yourself with people who are as good at what they do or better than you. And then knowing what their capabilities are. For me, it's being organized. Like mayhem drives me crazy. But, and then letting people do what they do. So my vision and my version of leadership now, or how I see it, is the ability to uh, bring a good team together, mm -hmm. allow them to do what they do, but keep them focused. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, in, in my life, uh, the, the where, places where I operate, that's what leadership is, uh, and establishing vision. 
So if you don't, if you're not someone who has vision and can carry through to the end of the vision or see how to execute it or can bring people on who can execute that vision, mm. leadership roles are probably not where you want to be. But mm. motivation mm. And, and respect, mm. it's, it's an interesting thing. And, and as I say, I'm still learning. Mm. And, you know, but are they born? Yeah, I think they're born. Yeah. And they're either nurtured or they nurture it or they don't. Yeah, yeah. Makes sense. Um, now let's talk about Tada. <sighs> Tell me about Tada events. Ah, oh, Tada events is my is my love child. Mm -hmm. um, we're almost twenty years at this now, and uh, we d we started out doing corporate events uh, and some theater, but. Mm -hmm. uh, we're kind of known for doing the big concerts, the big diva shows and so on, and the comedy fest and uh, with Pete and, and Leo. And, but our big musicals are our sort of trademark. And uh, we've had quite the ride in the last few years because, as I said, we were the show that mm -hmm. was on stage and was shut down. So we've, I've had four shows that we either canceled or pushed out during this last Mm -hmm. um, period of time, but we're tenacious, and this season we're about to. Well, actually, I'm giving you a scoop now because we're announcing our winter season now. So we're coming back with a vengeance, like full stage, full audience, and uh, the whole crew back for Divas in December. And we're doing. Uh, we've been commissioned by Frosty Festival to do their grand o their grand concert. So that's a big, big show, and then we're doing a two week run of Kinky Boots. Oh, and the Cindy Lauper show. We're doing Cindy Lauper show, yeah. <laughs> Hence the rim. Kinky boots. <laughs> I noticed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that should that should and be that should be fun. It is. It is fun, and it's, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's. I have musical directors who work with. The, they're such a strong team. So you know, Evan uh, Smith and Bill Brennan. They, they are mm. my go-to. Mm musical directors and they're right there from the beginning and Pam Pittman is uh, you know my principal choreographer Elizabeth Hartling is doing choreography on divas but we have there's several more there's you know costume designers and technical director and my stage managers we've all been together for a while and uh, John Rao over at Holy Heart said one time guys you roll you're like a machine you roll in and you roll out and that's what I'm talking about it's, mm -hmm. it's to die is not me I'm the figurehead if you will mm -hmm. and I'm Probably then. Well, I'm the money, <laughs> but um, they are the show, mm -hmm. and I will come in with a germ of, of a an idea and say I want to do this, and then they will take it, and then they will uh, they'll come back with something. I go, oh my God, that little video I had in my head could never have been as good as that. Now, when you're trying to figure out what kind of show to do, mm -hmm. uh, you actually fly to Broadway. I do a lot, yeah, and and check out shows in in. in New York, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, we just got back actually. Um, Pam and I were down there, and Jackie, who does all of our props, mm -hmm. um, we saw seven shows in five days. Oh God! <laughs> and the one with Hugh Jackman, the Music Man, was just because, like Hugh Jackman. Oh my God, yeah. Music Man. Um, but yes, we do. And sometimes we'll go down and meet with production teams and just see how they do things. Um, we're not going to reproduce Broadway shows. But um, what it allows us to do is take elements or say, you know, I'll be sitting there going, okay, I'll, I'll do the whole show like this, going, okay, I can see how they rigged that, and those lights are like this, and then Pam will be watching dance steps and saying, okay, you know, this is really an interesting thing, or, you know, um, so we'll, we'll look at that, and one of the things that I really want, wanted from the beginning, from Tada was that we could put, to the best of our ability, within our budget and, uh, and the technical uh, restraints that we have or the technical capabilities that we have, putting the package around some of these shows and these performers, because we've got, you know, we're, we're, we've got world-class performers. We say that all the time, but we've got a lot of them, and, uh, and they are world-class, and they're highly trained. You know, this is not mm. just a, a little hole in the wall anymore mm. from that talent perspective. Mm. But sometimes they don't have the package put around them. 
And so what a, a going down and seeing shows or going to London and seeing shows allows me to look at the package that's around something and then I'll come back and I'll start going click, 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 click. What can I do um, that will, to execute a show that will make it as visually and as, you know, audio and everything as, as good as we can and stays in the nature of mm. what the production was. Or I'll look at it and go, that was rats. Mm. <laughs> We're not going to go there. We're going to go. You know, we went to see a couple of productions. I, I, I won't say what they were, but some of the big ones we've done, yeah. and came back and said we will not do anything like that. So yeah. we've gone exactly the other way. Um, wh what's the most magical moment you've ever experienced in a theater? The most magical moment for me was in a dark theater, sitting down with a girl named Harmony, who was a, she was young, she was a, a teen. And she, after we did rehearsal, she was in a show, she came over and she sat down with me and she said, if you had some advice for me, I'm trying to get into theater school, I think at the time, and you had some advice for me, what would it be? And, and such a sweet question. And, um, and I said to her, well, I'll tell you a story. I auditioned when I was in Vancouver for the touring company in Cats. And I went to the audition and they line you up 20 some at a time and go, you, 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 you you're the type, you stay. I got through that. And then they did group movement dance, and I'm not a dancer, and I got through that. And I was like, hallelujah, I'm getting into the singing auditions and I'm a singer. And so I got in, you know, the people from New York were there and so on, and I stood up and they said, hi, uh, my name is Terry, la la la. And they said, can you hit the high C? And I went, oh yes, I can. And they said, thank you very much, you can go. And as I was walking out the door, I looked to the girl and I said, what just happened there? And she said, what did they ask you? I said, they asked me if I could hit the high C. And I said, yes, I can. She said, they're looking for the E and you had the opportunity to open your mouth and sell yourself and you didn't. And I went, oh, really? So when I was talking to this girl, Harmony, I said, my advice to you is when they ask you for the high C, tell them you got the E. And I got, this, I got an email, that was almost 20 years ago. I got an email a couple of years ago from Harmony and she said I'm at such and such a place I went to the audition they asked me if I had the high C I told them I had the E and I got the part and that defines my magical moment mm. thank you so much Terry <laughs> thank it's you great chatting with you Terry Andrews ladies and gentlemen and that's it for this edition of our program we'll see you again next time If you want convenience, Marie's Money Mart is here for you. A one-stop shop for a variety of products, homestyle breads, sandwiches, plus check out our freshly baked artisan breads and single-serve desserts exclusively at our in-store bakery on Frecker Drive. With 25 locations, wherever you go, there we are. If you have a comment about this program,